Hello, and welcome to Math Talk. I'm your host, Brian Heisler, and today I want to go over some more tips and tricks to help you out as you get through some problems on your GED math test. These are going to be a little more advanced problems than the ones I went through before, but I hope that they'll save you some time and allow you to get through this test a little easier. So let's get started. A couple questions I've seen on the test will be asking about whether something is a function or not. They'll give you either a graph or a set of points. If they give you a graph, it's really easy. To see if something is a function or not, it has to pass what's called the vertical line test, which is basically what it, what it sounds like. You draw a vertical line through your function. If it only crosses the line of the function one time, then yes, it is a function. If it crosses more than one time, no, it's not a function. So I've drawn a vertical line through this over here in green. It only crosses one time. This is a function. I drew a vertical line over here on the right through this curved uh, graph, and it passes through on the top and the bottom, which is more than once. So no, this is actually not a function. It fails the vertical line test. Now if you're given a set of points and you're asked, does this set of points represent a function? What you want to do is you want to see, does any, do any of the x values repeat or happen more than once? So if I go through this and look at just the x values, I notice that there's a 2 here and a 2 here, which means the x value of 2 repeats. This would not represent a function. If you were to graph it, you would get something that looks like this one on the right, and it would fail the vertical line test. It's important to point out, though, that there are two y values that repeat, 8 and 8. That's fine. You can have the y value repeat as many times as you want to, as long as the x value doesn't repeat. Okay, let's keep going. Distributing an expression. A question I get asked a lot in problems like these are, is that a minus sign or a negative sign? Well, I usually don't pay attention to that. I just pretty much treat it all as a negative sign. And when I do the operation, I say my answer and write out what I say, and then the answer just kind of forms itself. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to change colors for this. All right. So negative 3, you have a negative 3 times a positive 2. Negative times a positive is a negative 6x. And you have a negative 3 times a negative 4. Negative times a negative is a positive 12. Negative 3 times negative y. Again, a negative times a negative is a positive 3y. And then lastly, a negative times a positive is a negative 15x squared. So by saying the value of my answer negative positive and writing that all out, my answer just forms itself. And then you don't have to worry about is this a negative sign, is it a minus sign, etc. So that's just one of the ways that I do these problems. I hope it helps you out a little bit. Let's keep going. Composite figures. A composite figure is just a fancy way of saying a weirdly shaped figure. It's something that looks like this. It's not a perfect rectangle or triangle or square or whatever. But what you'll see with these types of problems is a bunch of different values for the lengths of sides. And they'll ask you, what's the perimeter of this? What's the area of this? So when I see a composite figure like this, what I like to do is break it up into individual pieces and then add them all together. So for example, I might take and draw a line here and here and kind of just break it up into five different pieces, left, right, top and bottom, and then the middle. Then I can figure out the, the length of each individual piece and add them all up. So for example, this left piece I know is an 8 by 10 figure, the bottom one is 11 by 17. Um, this top one is 5 by 17 as well. And I can just go through all of those and find the area or perimeter of each and add them all up. I'm not going to go through that. I just want to kind of guide you to these types of problems. All right, let's keep going. Okay, the last thing I want to go through in these, this set of tips and tricks is how to get rid of fractions or deal with fractions in an equation. Most people don't really like fractions in general, let alone when they're an equation. So what I like to do is I like to get rid of my fractions, and there's a quick way to do that. What you would have to do is multiply 
everything by the common denominator between your two fractions. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I know the common denominator between 3 and 2 is 6. So I'm going to multiply everything by 6. And what happens is you end up getting 6 over 3 plus 12 equals 6 over 2 minus 30. The nice thing now is that your fractions will reduce to whole numbers. 6 over 3 is 2. 12 stays the same. 6 over 2 is 3, and 30 stays the same. So now you have all whole numbers in your equation. You can continue on and go to solve them like that. It gets rid of the fractions. You don't have to worry about finding common denominators, adding, subtracting, all that stuff that nobody likes to do. So I hope this helps you out when you get to these types of problems. This gives you a little more time to answer other ones and makes it a little bit easier for you. Thanks. When you visit us at GEDES.com. For future tips and videos, be sure to subscribe and follow.